Hi, I'm Steve Berg, the uh, the CEO of Aish. Welcome to Good With Money podcast, where we invite exceptionally successful people to share their ideas about two things that we are at Aish are most passionate about. How can human beings reach their highest potential, and how can we work together to make the world a better, happier, more peaceful place? And just before we get started, please take a moment to subscribe to our YouTube channel and feel free to like and comment below. Today, it is my absolute pleasure, and I really mean that, and I'll explain more in a moment, to introduce uh, Michael Eisenberg. Michael is an equal partner at Aleph, an early stage venture capital fund with over 500 million under management. Aleph focuses on partnering with great Israeli entrepreneurs to a large, meaningful companies, impactful global brands. Uh, not only is Michael a very successful business uh, man. He's an incredible family man. He's an author. Uh, and uh, as we we'll may or may not talk about, we actually graduated from the same high school together. And so it's, it's really my absolute pleasure to welcome Michael to the program. Thank you for having me, Rabbi Berg. Uh, it's a miracle that we graduated high school together. <laughs> in high school together. <laughs> I took the words out of my mouth. I don't want to give it too much away. But uh, way back when, first of all, you know, it was uh, great times, but to, to be here together and to, to kind of see what you've accomplished uh, has been pretty, pretty amazing. It's mutual. It's mutual. It's uh, hard to imagine that that high school class uh, came all sorts of people that we run into later in life in, in amazing places. And it's, uh, you know, Miss Majewski would be proud. Oh, my absolutely. That was our English teacher who, uh, may she rest in peace, was uh, was really an incredible, uh, incredible personality. Uh, okay, but, but Michael, for all those that, that don't know you, you know, you've obviously post high school, uh, you've accomplished a lot. This, this happens to be, I, I kind of mentioned before, the fact that we also knew each other way back when, but I, we have so many folks uh, that come on this show that have done really incredible things in the business world. But what I'm really excited about here is it kind of brings the passion of the business world and building up Israel and the things you've accomplished actually um, in Israel is, is exciting for me. So maybe you can just start with, give us a little bit of background of kind of like, your, your path to kind of where you are today, just uh, from a business end. Sure. So it actually goes back to a uh, time right after we got out of high school uh, together. So uh, I went to that thing called early admissions at Yeshiva University, where we, where we skipped the senior year of high school and went to college. And after that first year of college, I took two years in Yeshiva in Israel. And during that time there, I had uh, just a wonderful time learning Torah. But beyond that, uh, I had an interaction with uh, Rabbi Yehuda Mital who was one of the heads of the yeshiva at the time. And kind of almost two years into my time there, right after the first Gulf War, I find myself in a room with him and like 15 other guys. And I asked Rabbi Amital, is there a greater mitzvah commandment to come settle the land of Israel if somebody settles in an uninhabited place or a very well populated place like Jerusalem or Tel Aviv? And he looked at me and said, that's all nonsense, real nonsense. You need to make Aliyah and start a factory that will employ 10,000 people to earn an honest and decent living. Wow. And that was transformational. You know, we, we went through high school together. I don't remember a single rabbi in high school saying to us, hey, the economy is really important. Jobs are really important. Sure. It was, you know, study another page of Talmud. And uh, although I should mention here, a rabbi we had in 11th grade, Rabbi Hecht, was super influential on me on kind of mixing this world of, of Torah and profession. He was a successful lawyer. He went back to be a high school rabbi. And, and so uh, – I basically decided at that moment I needed to move to Israel and try to build a factory to create 10,000 jobs. It turns out the technology economy ruined half that plan, which is don't build a factory in Israel. We should build software and Internet companies. And after spending a year and a half in political consulting, when I moved to Israel right after graduating Yeshiva University in college, uh, I found out that politicians don't create jobs and politics and political consulting doesn't create jobs. I'd get out of that. Right. And uh, then spent the last 25 years in venture capital, investing in startup companies and trying to build the Israeli economy. And uh, that's really my passion. And investing in startups is my passion. And Israel is my passion, obviously, in addition to family. And you, you, it's amazing how you're able to bring them, bring them all together. If you can, you know, if for us, it's such a wonderful window into that world. So just your perspective, number one is, what are you looking for? When, you, when someone comes to you, you must have people pitching you constantly all the time. What is it when someone walks in that you kind of see? What you know is it their leadership? Is it the idea? What is it that you see in a company that you say that's that's definitely something I should be I should be investing in? So the first is something in the people. Uh, I have partners at Benchmark, uh, my previous firm, that used to say uh, we're looking for learn it alls, not know it alls, and that's really really fundamental. 
Uh, learn it alls, not know it alls. We don't know all the answers. By the way, that's true in many facets of life, but it's certainly true in technological. Incredible answers. philosophy. That's an incredible life philosophy. Forget business. Yeah. It's amazing. And so, so we're looking for that. I don't know all the answers, and you can put anything on a piece of paper. But are we going to figure this out together? Are you going to kind of keep learning to figure this out? That's a core piece of it. Uh, resourceful people is really important. That's not just about learning. That's about there's hard times in starts up, startups. I don't know a single startup that kind of coasted from the beginning to end. So do you have that kind of resilience and resourcefulness to get, get through that? And three, and I think, by the way, this is underappreciated. Optimism matters a ton in life. Optimism wow. matters a ton. Uh, I, I often say, I hope nobody takes this personally, that pessimists are journalists, optimists win. And, and, <laughs> and so great. it's... This is important. Like entrepreneurs must be optimistic about the future of the world and the change they want to interact. And then I, I kind of derived this from my time uh, learning Torah, but I was able only to kind of capture it in, 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 in phrases in the last eight or nine years as I started writing. And, and that is that in the 21st century, great principles and values create great businesses. So I'm actually looking for values driven and principles driven businesses uh, you know, that, that we can build and transform the world with. Because I think in the 21st century, with the amount of transparency we have and change we have, people are looking to identify sure. this kind of principled innovation. And, and so that's become a fourth thing that I'm looking for. It's amazing. And just your whole description of almost like the humility that people bring in, the fact that they're not know-it-alls and the fact that they can learn. You know, it, it's an amazing life lesson that that business, so many people think they leave their ethics and morality kind of behind and they go jump into business. And basically what you're doing is you're saying, no, just the opposite. Those actually make the strongest businesses. Absolutely. You know, and I think if we look at some of the most spectacular failures of the last 25 years, it's, it's the result of transparency and people who, you know, didn't have ethics in their business. Whereas people like my friend Mark Benioff, the CEO of uh, Salesforce.com, he's put you know ethics at the core of his business. Salesforce sending uh, you know plane loads of relief help to COVID-stricken areas in, in in India. Now part of that is CSR corporate social responsibility was a little bit different from what I talk about in, in the books and and in my own investment philosophy. But Benioff's core model is what he called one one one, which is that people actually have to give their time you know, to, to charitable projects, et cetera, that creates a better workforce, better people and a better company. It's interesting you mentioned that because I've always known from the other side in terms of Salesforce has always been just a, a tremendous force of nature for nonprofits. And in terms of lowering the cost and helping and all those pieces, you see like all nonprofits use them because they, they really made that a priority. And I don't think they're making much profit all in that space, but I think that's probably part of their core values. He gave it away. Uh, to, to nonprofits to begin with. And I am tremendous amount of credit uh, for that. And he's been at the forefront of this, by the way, equal pay for women is another big flag that, that Benny off his phone and, you know, and it attracts better people. You know, we have a, uh, we have a maternity leave policy at Olive. just an example. You know, if you want to attract the best people, best people are family people, best people want to take maternity leave to pay, you know, to be with their kids that's what we should do. Those good values create better businesses. And, you know, I could go on and on, but, but you, you get the point. And, and Mark, God bless his soul, has been really at the forefront of this. That's, uh, that's true. I'm glad, I'm glad to hear that. Let me, let me shift gears a drop in terms of that, in terms of values and the ethics and all those pieces of businesses. Could you shed a little light on the Israeli kind of approach? I mean, it's very obvious to anyone that's dealt with Israelis versus uh, Americans versus Europeans. There's different mentalities in the different places you go around the world. And sometimes there's tremendous strengths in that. And sometimes there's weaknesses there. What, you know, in terms of, of being an American who has, has, has set down his roots and really built up uh, an innovative Israeli companies, what have you found there? I think we're all kind of interested to hear that. Boy, how long do we have? <laughs> as long as you need. Uh, yeah. So, um, number one, uh, I think that principles-driven innovation is happening in Tel Aviv today more than any other place in the world. There is something about the people of the book, and the people of the book are the Jewish people, but it's Israel in particular that is driving more principles-based innovation out of here. I see way more here than I said of Silicon Valley or New York or Austin. Um, and I think that's really important. Uh, I joked in the book that, you know, from Zion will go forth the Torah. The new Zion in the case of innovation is actually Tel Aviv uh, and not Jerusalem and certainly not Silicon Valley, despite the great example Mark Benioff has set. And I think that's a really important thing. Number two, uh, Israelis 
just view the world differently. And growing up in a small country, um, which A, fights for its survival and needs to be innovative, but two, puts everybody through the military, creates a higher sense of loyalty and fraternity among the people doing this. I think that's super important. Uh, engineers and people who are, who are well sought after stay at Israeli companies longer than they do at Valley companies, and I think, or New York companies. I think that creates continuity and a esprit de corps that is kind of super fundamental to hear. You know, where is Israeli's challenge? Storytelling. Um, you know, we, we went to speech taking class in, in university, and Miss Maevsky taught us how to write. Yeah. Those are not well taught skills in high schools and colleges in Israel. And so, you need to do a lot of work on messaging, marketing, and, and and speech giving and storytelling. When we started Olive, we invested a ton of money and resources in that. We actually have full time people, three or four now, who this is what they work on: messaging, marketing, and storytelling for our portfolio companies. Says it's a real hole. And I think, by the way, some of the challenges Israel has in media is around that. We're not good storytellers, and the reason is because it's very what's called in Hebrew tachlis oriented. Everything needs to be real here because life is so real. Right. There's no facade and um, nothing to do about it. There's like uh, a large part of entrepreneurship is telling a great story about the future. And that's important in painting that, painting that picture. And we got to get better at that here. It's so fascinating to hear you say that because, you know, one of the the, the challenges, you know, I, I sat with uh, recently with Gilad Erdogan, who's the ambassador at the UN. We're talking about the 20th anniversary of the German conference and, you know, all the, the BDS movement starting. And, you know, we just get into this whole thing about like on social media, the Israeli government, the Israelis are really bad at getting their story out there, really, really struggle. And I think what you probably just listed is is, is a kind of a reason behind that. You know, they're... they're, they're they're insistent on being precise, which has a lot of value over the long term. And if right. you talk kind of, you know, the Army spokesman's office is all about precise, but that causes you not to understand the medium. And if the medium is the message, and that is the case, you need to adapt your strategy there. Moreover, nobody's actually sat down since the beginning of the state and wrote a, wrote a kind of comprehensive narrative about what the next 70 years of the state ought to look like and what are the core values. And it's been Successful, I think, beyond Ben Gurion's belief uh, or Herzl's yeah. belief, right. and and so we need to we need to solve that. And Israel's also transitioning. This is becoming a much wealthier country over the last decade than it was for a long time, and high tech is a big part of that, and innovation is sure. a big part of that. This is one of three or four innovation centers in the world, but we got to tell that story right. And what's I think an interesting thing to point out, as often is the case, the private sector is ahead of the public sector on this. So Israeli companies are getting much better in the last three, four, and five years at storytelling and becoming creating global brands and global principles-based brands than it has in the last 65 years combined. Wow. The government's not there yet. That's right. not that surprising. It, it, and what's amazing, it's, for me, again, I'm just kind of, I'm kind of listening to you. It sounds like you took kind of like your American culture upbringing and you carried it over to Israel to say, okay, you guys are really great at innovate piece. Let me let me give you some of the pieces that I picked up having come from North America and being able to synthesize the two to really create something special. I think it's more just pointing out how important it is. I, I don't do any of the work, actually. It's the entrepreneurs that are the real heroes and the guys who drive the change sure. and, and create the value. I'm just a grease. But I try to put it on the table that this is an important value from day one. Um, you know, sometimes I hear, oh, there's Michael again. He's telling a story. But it's, you know, I think it's it's fundamental. How do you create change? You need to change the narrative, right? Yeah. But more than that, I have a friend, Jeff Swartz, who says you also got to narrate the change. And I think that's really important and lost on a lot of people. That's great. That's great. I, I want to shift a little bit here. You know, you 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 touch, touch on it before about the importance of family within businesses and, and really realizing that, you know, where, you know, the 50s, 60s, you just, you know, you work your brains off and the whole thing, realizing that people that have good family lives and good work uh, family balance. Uh, you wrote a blog, I think, right? You, you wrote a blog. I, I was, was looking at it. It was at some point it was like, uh, was it six kids and a full-time job? And now I think you have more than that. But uh, so you've been pretty open in terms of that. That's a, a core value that's been around for a long time. Maybe just talk a little bit about your family, even personally, kind of how that works into who you are on a holistic level. So uh, I talk often with high school kids. I give talks in high school. One of the things I say when I always get asked, okay, what's the last piece of advice you'd give is uh, get married young and have children. And, and I really believe that deeply. I think getting married young, life is better shared. Life is better with a partner, especially one who will hold up a mirror to you. 
and also be there when things go up and down because everything in life goes up and down and business goes up and down and there are hard yeah. times and better times. It's just life. And uh, life is better shared. And having kids young when you can kind of invest energy in them, I think is important. But more than that, you learn to love unconditionally and you learn to love different people because when you look at your own kids who come out of the same parents and genetic makeup, you go, how do they all turn out so different? And they continue to turn out different. And so we right. can learn to uh, accommodate and understand and help uh, other people. That, that's an important thing. The second thing I'll say is I actually don't believe in work-life balance. I think this is a false creed that we sell to a young generation that's really confused um, and is trying to find balance. You know, if anything happened in the last 48 hours that's taught us in Afghanistan, there is no balance in the world. It doesn't exist. It's a false promise. Right. And what we're actually after is we want to be the best uh, husband, the best dad, the best business person, the best uh, charitable person, the best community person at all points in time. But there's 24 hours in a day. So we juggle time, but we're always out of balance. And if you feel you're out of balance, you're actually doing something right, not wrong. It means that you're trying to fill your day with good things that does, as long as you're not playing Candy Crush, you're doing great. Right. And so um, we can feel out of balance and understand the world is out of balance. And if we're investing our time in it and trying to move it forward, we're doing good. And we need to tell people it's okay to be out of balance. We are not seeking balance. We are seeking forward movement activity and to try to be as good as we can at what we're doing. And sometimes we fail, by the way. my you know Being a venture capitalist has taught me very clearly that you fail a lot. I, you know, 50% of my investments go to zero. So I'm a giant failure. Right. Right. It's, it, you know, that's what they say in baseball. A guy hits 300, three out of 10 times. He's a, uh, he's an all-star. Uh, do you set goals? How do you go about, I mean, what, what you just said was, was really beautiful in terms of keep moving forward, meant the most things in terms of your like, Oh, do you sit down a certain time of year and say, these are my goals here. I want to hit, or is it just kind of something, you know, in your mind, how do you go, how do you go about setting goals? Boy, I try to, I'm bad at them. Uh, I like to kind of sit down before Rosh Hashanah, which is coming up and, and set goals. But what I've discovered is life is so dynamic and the world is dynamic and opportunity is unpredictable. And so the best laid goals are not helpful. And what, I, what I'm trying to optimize for as I've gotten older is a supple mind that will pick up changes and opportunity. Um, and I find that the goals are actually constricting. And so I, I, I'm looking for kind of points of leverage that enable you to take advantage of opportunity that sometimes comes your way and you can't predict when it comes. Can, can you drill down an example of that? Or you just said something very powerful about op opportunities is unpredictable, which was, you know, it was almost like a throwaway comment, but it was so very powerful. Can you give us like an example? Do you give an example of something where, you know, it's something just pops up and, and, and you know that you have to move? I'll give you two uh, from two different spheres of life. One is my wife. So uh, my mom had pushed me to date. This happened to many of us in Yeshiva University. And I went out with uh, two women. It wasn't going well. And I decided I was on a break from dating. I didn't come to Israel to work for the summer. And uh, I landed and due to my grandmother, I had to go deliver somebody thing immediately to somebody's house. And I turned up there. And sitting there was this young woman who had also just come back from a trip to Poland. And we both turned up to wish Mazel Tov and had something over to a person staying in that apartment. And we struck up a conversation. And uh, the person whose house it was called me 24 hours later, and I knew her since we were kids, and said, hey, you really ought to date Yaffa. And I go, no, I'm on a break. He says, uh, you really ought to date her. I said, no, I'm on a break. And she persuaded me. Now, had I not said yes to that opportunity, who knows what happened to these eight kids and you know, grandkids, thank God, and, and, and 28 years of wonderful marriage. So you need to be kind of willing to be open uh, to that. I was almost this close to being too closed. And Wow. Well, how life would have turned out. I, I'll give you another example. Um, so I, I have time in my day to meet entrepreneurs that come over the transom or people that I'm tracking uh, because I think they're just really amazing people. And uh, so there's a guy, his name is uh, Matan Bar. Uh, Matan Bar is one of the three founders of a company called Melio, uh, now worth billions of dollars. And he was down the block. And we had this thing that we just pop into each other's offices to brainstorm ideas in the world of, of finances and payments, et cetera. And one day he called me up and uh, he said, hey, I got an idea. Can I come by right now? And I know this is a good guy. I had another meeting, actually. 
um, when he wanted to come by. And I said, I'm going to cancel the meeting, move it to the next day, reschedule it. Because Matan is, a, is, is an amazing opportunity. He came, he says, I got this. He said what it was, which was branded ACR, and said, I won't spare the time. How did that become a company that's worth billions of dollars? And on the spot, we said, okay, we'll invest on the spot. And so, you know, these are opportunities come up, and you have to be open to them. And when my partner at Benchmark, Bruce Dunleavy, used to say that if you're dealing with a lot of garbage uh, and Google walks into the waiting room, you won't have time to meet them. And I think that's really true. That's interesting. That's great. Those are great, great examples. Let's just shift for a moment. You're also, aside from being a family man and all have you done busy, you're also an author. And and uh, we were like getting on here. We're talking about turning off our phones. You're like, when you're right, you got to turn off your phone. And you know, I was, I was, I thought that was terrific because I also do a lot of writing and stuff. Tell us a little bit about your your books and your writing and and what that's meant for you and meant to the world. I can't say what it's meant to the world, but uh, you know, my writing. I've written five books in Hebrew and now two in English. The second one is due out in uh, in a week and a half called The Tree of Life and Prosperity, which is 21st century uh, business insights from the book of Genesis. And uh, these started as just table conversations around the Shabbat dinner table on, on the weekly portion. And, and every commentator or exegete brings their own baggage with them when you look at texts and when you look at ideas and, you know, I'm fond of saying that the Ibn Ezra, who, you know, was a medieval exegete was very poor. And he looked at his commentary on, on the Bible through that lens. And uh, Maimonides was a doctor uh, and his commentary on the Bible that lens. And, and the Barbanel, Rabbi Isaac Donna Barbanel, who was thrown out of Spain in 1492, hated the monarchy for it, looked negatively on the monarchy in biblical text because of that. My baggage is technology innovation and 21st century economics and investing. That's my baggage. Right. And, so, and so the discussions at the table, to, you know, took that, that flavor and I wrote them down and uh, I started making notes. And then in kind of one year, I guess it's like five years ago now, four years ago, I sent them out as weekly eight to 10 page missives to a WhatsApp group of like 140 people. And a couple of people said, you know, you got to turn this into a book. Um, which I did. And so I've written three, I wrote one, one book on the book of Esther, which is a study of anti-Semitism versus assimilation mm -hmm. in the Jewish people from an economic lens through the story of the book of Esther. But this series is, is going to be on all five books of the Torah. It's only three are written in Hebrew. The first one's coming out in English. And what it does is look at the stories of the Torah and the, and the commandments through an economic lens and how you interpret them into modern challenges. So I'll give you one example if I, if I have a second. Um, so Noah, the sages tell us, but it's obvious from the verses, invented the plow. And in his generation, there was a Thomas Malthus. His name was Jared, by the way, who said, the world's coming to an end. We can't feed humanity. Let's stop having children. If that sounds like Maureen Dowd in the New York Times of two weeks ago, it's because it is. And uh, in every generation, we have these pessimistic people. And the world's coming to an end. And there's, a, by the way, side point, there's a great book by a guy named Matt Ridley called The Rational Optimist, which I highly recommend. All the times the world was coming to an end, and here we are. Right. And so uh, Noah looks at this problem and says, we can solve this. Let me invent the plow. And he invents the plow, and humanity gets to an age of abundance. And Noah's an innovator, by the way. He has a second invention, which is chemistry or fermentation, which is wine. He he plants vineyards and he makes wine. He's the first person in the Bible to make, make wine. Noah's problem, though, was that with his great innovation, which led to great abundance, perhaps great happiness from the wine, there were no principles attached to it. So the abundance created by his innovation destroyed humanity in addition to moving it forward. His invention of wine destroyed his family on some level instead sure. of moving it forward. And this, by the way, we know through history, Alfred Nobel was the same story, right? He invented dynamite. He left the Nobel Peace Prize because the dynamite was great innovation, moved the world forward at the same time it destroyed it. And so you look at Noah and you say, okay, we have artificial intelligence. We have synthetic biology, amazing innovation coming in the world right now. But where are the timeless principles that will undergird this, that will buttress this to make sure the world doesn't destroy itself, it doesn't destroy families, et cetera. And that's what I'm looking to pull out of the books. And through all the chapters of Genesis, that's what I look at. It's, it's textual analysis. It's challenging.
But at the same time, it's really modernized analysis of how this applies to our life and our innovations and economies today. What, what I love about talking to you is you have consistent themes that run really in all different pieces. I'd like to shift gears now a little bit just to talk about philanthropy. And, uh, you know, I noticed in your bio, you know, you, you start off by, by uh, getting advice from your rabbi uh, at Yeshiva. And now you sit on the board of that Yeshiva, you know, when he told you to start the factory. But just in terms of, of philanthropy and really uh, being able to give to give back and to, you know, it, you know, I, I'm, I'm almost curious to hear how you approach it. Do you approach it kind of using that same lens? You know, how do you make your decisions to kind of help and build the world? I, I, I wish I told you I had a strategy uh, or when I got started, the answer is I don't. Um, and, and by the way, the yeshiva is a little bit of an aberration in, in the philanthropic work, work I do. So I, I treat it a lot like a venture capital investment. Um, I want to be at the riskiest point of creation of philanthropic endeavor with the most aspirational goals. And I actually burn money doing this, which is I know some percentage of my philanthropic work is, is not going to work out. Um, that's my assumption. I had a program. Uh, in Jerusalem around economic empowerment. The first one I did around economic empowerment it was at a large scale. It was really, really successful on seven people. Um, and I proved to myself one thing, we could do this, but it doesn't scale. Like well, kill the right. program. Mm -hmm. um, it worked for seven people. We couldn't scale it. And, uh, and others where, you know, you get a seed, you invest, you start to develop. We iterate. I drive people crazy about this because I'm always trying to learn more and iterate. And help them learn more. You know, it doesn't have to stay with the same idea. And, and we go do this. You know, what we have. A, I have an amazing story about this this uh, not for profit I started called Nouveau Network. So the first thing you got to find is the entrepreneur, right? So I interviewed, interviewed, interviewed eighteen people until I found a woman named Abby Own, who had been in professional development at Duke and at Harvard, the Kennedy School, and met a guy from Israel, moved here. He's a tech guy, and she ran a not for profit here. I finally met her. First meeting, I knew she was it. And my idea was I wanted to provide scholarships to people who come do master's degrees in technology subjects or science subjects in Israel. So you finish the first degree in the U.S. and you come to Israel. And I said, OK, go figure this out. And she came back. She did a road trip up and down East Coast schools and, and out and came back and said, they're off. And I said, why am I off? She said, everybody's got the same concern. I don't have a professional network in Israel. What do we do about that? So we should do a professional network. And then we also won't step on birthright's toes and other people's toes. And the professional network will be the on-ramp. And I said, okay, we've learned something. Let's go. And, and we set this up. And she's doing amazing work. You should look this up. If you have people who are listening or are thinking of moving to Israel and they're in tech, this Nouveau network has become amazing. Two wow. short years in, we have you know, many multiples more applicants than we can accept for the fellowship. Um, it's become a real professional network, people helping each other get ahead of their careers. And I think these people, by the way, give me my best shot in not creating 10,000 jobs, but letting them create hundreds and hundreds of thousands of jobs because they're just amazing. amazing. These are all limb who are making impact, you know, people move to Israel in, in the tech world and the economy here. So, Michael, would you say, and this is what I'm, again, I'm, I'm developing themes, you know, we're running out of time, we're almost done, but but the themes, would you say that you really give more to the person than the cause, meaning it sounds like you identify talent and say this person can go out and, and create and build things, I'm going to invest in that person, it seems like that's really what drives you, it's really about, it's really about people identifying the people that can really get things done, whether it be business, philanthropy, or or other. Yes, but, in, yes, but. In, in philanthropy, my big topic has been uh, economic empowerment. So uh, you know, I serve as chairman of the Shomer Hadash, which enables, which is the New Guardians, which enables farmers and ranchers in this country uh, to make an honest and decent living and be protected and get the farm hands they need uh, when they need it and build solidarity. And Nouveau, we mentioned, and I, I have a couple of economic empowerment. That's a big theme for me. Mm -hmm. uh, and in all those places, because it's innovative and entrepreneurial, you really need to identify a person. And Yoel Zilberman, who runs the Shomer HaChadash and his partner, Owen Weifman, are extraordinary entrepreneurs just in the social sphere. Um, and uh, and Abby's extraordinary. And a guy named Ezzy Fisher, who runs other stuff for me, just extraordinary people. But I'm largely around economic empowerment. I, I've done some other stuff as well, as you mentioned, the yeshiva, et cetera. But I'm, Rabbi Amital said 10,000 jobs. We got to spread the blessing of the tech economy 
to eight million people in Israel, and I'm really, beautiful. really focused on it. And that's that's beautifully said. And it's it's you know, as my mom said, it's you know, instead of giving someone charity, teach them how to fish, teach them a profession, and then basically they'll be able to to support themselves. Um, I, I have to tell you, I knew this going in. I said this at the outset that this would be one of my favorite conversations. I just have to tell you on a personal level, um, I really feel like on behalf of so many people around the world, that, that what you have done uh, to help the economy in Israel, what you're continuing to do um, is, is absolutely inspiring to a lot of us. And also the way you're, you're able to keep your identity in, and weave it you know, from the Bible and to kind of give those examples. Um, it, it, it's something I think it was really, really special for, for everyone. Any last words before we, uh, we sign off here? First of all, thank you for the opportunity. This was a lot of fun to do this with someone who I know so long. That's uh, That always makes it uh, more fun. I do want to say one thing. I, the world's going through a lot of change right now, and there's a lot of negative news out there. And, you know, Twitter and social networks can drive you nuts um, with the negativity. And, and pessimism sells, sells newspapers and headlines. But I think there's a lot to be optimistic about right now in this, in this era of change. And I think there's... You know, the more we do, the more we say we can harness the future and we can actually drive the future. Part of the reason I moved to Israel is I want to be where the future of the Jewish people was. I want to be where the future of innovation was because that's the future. And we can drive this. And people should be more optimistic and, and reach out to other people and have conversations with people you disagree with without getting angry on social media. It, you know, it gets yeah. things off our heart, but it's it's a real limitation in doing stuff. And do more with more optimism. We'll all be in a better place. Thank you. Thank Michael. Thank you. This was awesome. And uh, God willing, we'll, we'll, maybe we'll grab some coffee in together in person. Okay. We're together in, in Jerusalem. Uh, as Michael Eisenberg uh, with us today. Thank you so much for uh, joining Good With Money. We hope you enjoyed this chat and you agree that the very best thing about success is the opportunity it provides to lift the world up along with you. Uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you so much.